Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for jumping on this webinar today. Um, it's going to be entitled uh, Getting Technical, the Ins and Outs of Operating a Direct-to-Garment Printer. Uh, I plan on showing you quite a bit of information today. Uh, I do want to start by saying that there is going to be a question and answer uh, section at the very end of this webinar. Uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions in the uh, chat box or uh, whatever box is there right in front of you, uh, and I'll make sure that I do cover them all. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, my name is Adam Tapre. I'm the National Sales Manager at Anajet, now a RICO company. Um, I've been with Anajet now for over eight years and now with RICO for almost a year. Uh, actually, January 7th, I think, will be uh, um, uh, a full year that uh, RICO has owned us. Uh, so, I, like I said, I've been with uh, Anajet for eight years. I've seen the technology develop, and I thought to myself when uh, I was talking with our, our wonderful partner today, Asai, that we've done so much revolving around how to uh, grow your business that I thought it would be great if we talked about some of the more technical uh, uh, aspects of direct garment printing, and that's where this uh, webinar came from. Um, so let's get started. Part of what we're going to cover is uh, ink. Uh, and the colors uh, and, and what consists of the ink. We'll talk about curing uh, and why that's important. Uh, we'll discuss the major components within the printer and why they're there and why they're important. Uh, most notably the print heads uh, with a quick explanation of what uh, DPI means. Uh, maintenance station, uh, lines and dampers, um, then we'll go into preventative maintenance and why that's really critical. And then finally, that question and answers that I mentioned to you earlier. So let's just dive in. So first off, ink. So there's a lot of different kinds of ink that is being developed for direct garment printing. As we're all aware, direct garment printing is kind of the cutting edge technology of apparel uh, uh, production. Right now, the most commonly, I'm going to talk about the more common things, right? So there's other kinds of things, but I'm going to take the, what, 99% of the industry out there is using. And it's a water-based pigment in ink, okay? direct garment pr printing has essentially five colors, although there is options for other colors and um, different printers that have multiple colors. But for the most part, they work off a of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and then a white ink cartridge or a white, uh, a white ink rather. Now, this is where it gets a little bit different than um, maybe screen printing. We use a four color process. Direct garment printers use a four color process. What that means is they take those cy the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and they mix them in such a way that it produces the appropriate color that you need. Think about it in terms of uh, it, when you were a kid and you uh, had your yellow crayon and your blue crayon and you colored yellow and then you colored over with blue and it made green. That's essentially what's happening with these four colors is that we're taking five drops of cyan, ten drops of magenta, one drop of yellow, and two drops of black to get that red that you want, right? That's how that works. And then the white ink is, is for the underplay. Now, the cool part about this is that with these four colors, you can technically generate as many as 16 million different colors. So you, you can really get a wide spectrum of colors that, that are out there. Um, and, you know, for the most part, with the exception of uh, uh, neon colors, uh, uh, the four color process can pretty much get you any color that you need under the sun. Um, there are small exceptions, like I said, neon. Um, obviously, metallic colors like gold or silver uh, can't be uh, done. But any red, blue, purple, green, pink, yellow, anything under the sun in regards to that, that can be easily generated with a, with a CMYK process. Um, now, why that's different is with typically, if, if there are any people on here, that typically the, uh, that have worked with screen printers, what they do is, um, well, to make it kind of more generalized, uh, if you ever went into Home Depot and you picked that certain color that you want to paint your wall, uh, what they do is they, they take a white bucket of paint and then they apply 
drops to that bucket of paint, mix it all up, and then that becomes your color. Okay, so it's a little bit different. They start with white, add drops or what, whatever they need to get the right color, and that gets them their color. Whereas with this process, you're taking a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, mixing those colors up together, and getting the correct color that you want. And most printers do this, uh, and, and not just direct-to-garment printers, but your desktop printer, um, your Rico printer that's sitting, you know, that does all your copying and uh, and, and faxing. It does this too. Um, it's very rare that you would have a, a different type of setup um, outside of a printer because it's the most efficient way and it gives you the best color gamut for the uh, uh, the ink that you have. Now, a special note that I put on here down on the bottom is the uh, whiting. Uh, and I think it's really critical for us to understand this because it's really going to play a major part in the next couple of slides. White ink has a substance in it that is called titanium dioxide. And if you look around the room that you're in right now, anything that you see that's white, more than likely is white because of the titanium dioxide. It's, a, it's the actual pigment that's in the ink. It's what makes it white. But it has some properties in it that you have to be aware of. One of the things that it does is it dries very, very quickly. As soon as it comes in, comes in contact with air, it dries. And the best way I've been able to describe it is if you've ever had a bucket of paint that you left the top off of, and you get that film right on the top, that's the titanium dioxide reacting with the oxygen in the air, causing it to dry and thicken and harden, okay? The other piece of it is that the titanium dioxide, when mixed with a water-based ink, right, it's actually heavier than the rest of the ink. So what happens is, is if the white ink sits too long in any printer, the titanium dioxide literally starts to sink in the lines or sink in the dampers, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. And it's what they call it settling. And it's the white ink and the and the and the uh, the titanium dioxide rather and the water kind of dispersing, becoming unmixed, and that's something we don't want, right? We don't want that to happen. We want that white to hold the consistency that we want it to be at that viscosity level, that mixture. We want it to be right at that level, right? So that doesn't happen with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. It only happens with the white, and it's. Uh, specifically because of the titanium dioxide that's in the ink, okay? Now, I'm going to come back to that in the next couple of slides, but just wanted to make a quick point. And again, I'm sure there's going to be some questions, so feel free to, I'll, I'll make sure that I get to all of them towards the end here. But in addition to ink, after you print and you printed your shirt, the ink has to cure, okay? Essentially, by heating up the ink to the appropriate levels, you cause a chemical reaction to bind the ink to the fabric and evaporate all of the water out of the ink. Okay? You can cure by doing it a few different ways. There's uh, tunnel dryers, uh, there's uh, heat presses, but the main piece of this is to cause that reaction to have the ink bind to the fabric, you have to hit a certain temperature for a certain amount of time so that when you try to wash the shirt, it doesn't wash out. Now, people will often say, um, you know, how's the washing of, uh, of, of your shirts? Well, as long as they're cured correctly, at the correct temperature and time, that wash and that print should last the life of the shirt. And this is the same thing with screen printing or uh, um, uh, sublimation. Um, the inks are at a level in all of those different fields that they, it, they, told, they should last on the garment for the life of, the life of the garment as long as it's being cured correctly. So if I ever have a customer uh, ha have wash concerns, my first instinct is to go to their curing method and determine why. Uh, I, I've listed down here for dark shirts, you want to do, if you're using a heat press, 330 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 seconds. That's what it says in the manual. But I've gone as far as telling my customers that if they have concerns on it, that 
up your temperature to 335 degrees Fahrenheit and go for 95 seconds. Or for a light shirt, instead of 356 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 seconds, go to 360 for 35 seconds. It's not going to be high enough temperature to burn or char the shirt. Of course, the caveat here is depending on the shirt. But it'll ensure that the print is on there and isn't going to go anywhere. And as long as you do that, you'll be in good shape. Okay? So that's kind of ink in a nutshell. That's kind of the big picture. I, I, I thought about going into more detail in terms of the chemistry of it, and I thought, well, I'm, getting, I'm going down a rabbit hole. But just to be aware that we use a four-color process. direct to garment printing uses a four-color process that can generate up to 16 million different colors. Okay? And uh, the white ink has that titanium dioxide in it that gives it, that makes it white, but it has two properties that we need to be aware of and to account for. So when we print, we reduce the amount of maintenance and things like that. And then curing is the most critical piece to washing. As long as you're curing your garment with the ink on it at the appropriate temperature and time, you're going to get good wash results and your customers are going to be happy. And in the end, that's the main thing, right? We want your customers to be sitting there with their shirt that's five years old and that print still looks great. And I can speak to that myself. Uh, one of the first things I did eight years ago when I started working at Anajet was they stuck me in a room with a printer and I printed for an entire week just learning about the technology and the process. And I still have shirts uh, from that uh, that week long training that I went through um, that I still have today and that I wear uh, today. So keep that in mind. Now I want to go over some of the main components of the printer. Okay, there's a lot of moving pieces inside of it. Okay, but there are really just a, a, the few pieces that are the most critical. You know, call it the brains and the circulatory system, so to speak, uh, of, a, of a human body is kind of, that's what this is for the printer. Okay? The first one is the print heads. Now, the print heads are a critical piece, as you can imagine, of a direct-to-garment printer. Now, what you see on your screen there to the right, that top image, that's a single print head. That's the Rico Gen 4 printhead. The bottom screen, uh, the bottom image that you see on the right, that bigger piece, that's actually an Empower 10 printhead carriage. And there are six printheads in that carriage. And to the left, you'll see a, a, a competitor uh, printhead. Um, I did this to try to show you uh, some scale, right? So first and foremost, in the Empower 5, we have three print heads. And in the Empower 10, we have six print heads. Okay. The print head's main purpose is to fire drops onto the garment in a specific way so that you get the appropriate dimensions and colors out of the image. Okay. So I'll, let me dissect that a little bit. The print head takes the data that you sent through your software into your printer and determines how many drops it needs to fire out of the printhead. And these are microscopic drops, very, very small drops. How many drops of each color it needs to spit out to get, remember the mixture, the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, to get the appropriate color that you want in the appropriate place on the garment. So really, this is the main kind of most important piece of direct garment printing. This is a, a you know high quality print heads. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. High quality print heads are critical not just because they reproduce exactly what you want to see on the screen onto your shirt, but they have to do it over and over and over and over again, and they have to be able to be robust enough uh, to handle the type of ink that is being put through, the type of work that we're putting it through, um, and, uh, and the, the frequency and the operation of it. So it's a good solid print head is pretty critical. 
Now, we were lucky enough, even before Rico purchased us, to start using the Rico Gen 4 printhead. Uh, and they are just perfect for direct-to-garment printing because of their uh, um, uh, the size of the novel and their ability to handle the kind of ink that we're pushing through it. Um, they were actually designed for a few different kinds of inks, and one of them being our water-based pigmented CMYK and white ink that I was mentioning earlier. But by allowing the print, by by sending the image to the printer, the print head is really the piece that says, okay, I need, uh, you know, on, on each spot, I need 100 drops of this and 50 drops of this and 10 drops of that to get the appropriate color on that, that specific location. And it does this incredibly fast and in very, very small drops. It's actually a pretty impressive piece of technology. Printhead drops can be applied in quite a lot of ways. Okay, you'll hear a term called DPI. All right, DPI is drops per inch. All right. Now, on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's 300 by 300 drops per inch. You can imagine that's. Uh, I mean, think about hold up a, an a, an inch in between your fingers and imagine 300 drops going across and 300 drops going down. That's the kind of detail that I'm talking about. But it gets even more detailed. Then there's 600 by 600 drops per inch. Then there's 1200 by 600 drops per inch. And even more, 1200 by 1200 drops per inch. Now why do we need that? Why do we need that many drops? Those small little drops, why do we need that many? Well, because that determines the quality that you get, depending on what you're trying to print on. And that's where these blue dots that, I, that are on your screen come in. By overlaying the dots, you can get a much clearer and higher quality image. And even if you have a few nozzles missing, it'll cover up imperfections. So. Look at that top screen where it says 10 dots. Those 10 dots spread out. You can, you can imagine on a microscopic level when you're looking at your shirt, but there are spaces in between each dot. Now imagine if I did those same dots, but I compressed them to about half the size. You could see less, less uh, um, uh, space in between each dot. Really, the only space is on the top portion of the dot. I'm going to bring my mouse in here to show you. The top portion of the dot here and here. But right here looks perfect. Then if we go down to here, still the same 10 dots, you can see that it's almost completely gone and that you get that solid, rich color. That's where the increased drops per inch make the biggest difference. The other variable here is the surface that you're printing on, what they call the substrate that you're printing on, okay? For example, imagine that you're printing on a piece of paper that we all do, right? Now, the drops per inch on a piece of paper, paper doesn't uh, absorb the ink as uh, as much as say a uh, a direct garment printer would or a, a, a t-shirt would rather so you don't actually need that much of a difference when it comes to your dpi or, or i'm sorry i take that back excuse me i misspoke you, you need a higher dpi because there's more of an opportunity for you to see these spaces in between each dot most of your desktop printers that you see, that you, that you have, are probably printing in a 1200 by 1200 or 1440 by 1440 or higher drops per inch. Because on a piece of paper, it would be a heck of a lot easier to see these in-between gaps that you see my mouse going over. They want it to look like this. 
Now with direct to garment printing, it's different. And the reason being is because the shirt has the ability to absorb the ink. And uh, the, the, you know, take a drop of water and drop it on a uh, on a piece of paper and watch it spread over the piece of paper and get absorbed into the piece of paper. That's what the shirt is doing, but on a greater effect with our ink. So I can print, let's say, these ten dots and this ten dot range call it 1200 by 1200 or 600 by 600 and to the to the naked eye you won't be able to tell the difference because the shirt has grabbed the ink and it's spread out and it's kind of absorbed any of these imperfections that you see on the top here okay so i hear a lot of people that talk to me about well what you know what what's the max dpi your printer can print at well, our director garment printer can print at 1200 by 1200 DPI, but I've never printed at 1200 by 1200 DPI on a shirt because I don't need to. Because not only does 1200 by 1200 DPI slow my printer down because it takes longer to drop that many because I'm traveling the, not as far but still applying the same amount of dots, but it's overkill because eventually the ink on a microscopic level spreads out and covers up any imperfections. To put this a better way, um, if I printed a shirt, uh, say on our MP10, and I printed it at 600 by 600 DPI, that print would probably take about 20 seconds. If I did that same image at 1200 by 1200 DPI, that print would take about 40 seconds. If I held those two shirts up right next to each other, you probably couldn't tell the difference between them. After they were cured, they would look virtually identical. Maybe some subtle things here and there, but virtually identical. So although DPI is important, and it's important to understand what it means, it's also important to understand that your substrate, specifically the garment, plays a bigger part of the uh, uh, end result than the actual DPI that you're printing. Now, if I was printing on, say, a sheet of canvas or photo quality paper, well, I would print with a higher DPI because it's not going to spread as much. It's not going to absorb into the shirt as much and cover up those imperfections. And I'll need that kind of detail. It's good that kind of detail will be critical, but for a garment, t-shirt, sweatshirt, or otherwise, higher DPI doesn't necessarily mean higher quality print. If anything, it means that you need to learn how to operate your printer better because you're wasting time. And as we all can attest, if you have something that takes you twice as long, um, that's a big waste of time. If I print 50 shirts and each one takes me 20 seconds, uh, and then I try to print those same 50 shirts and each one takes me 40 seconds, that's the difference between 20 minutes and 40 minutes of me actually getting the print done. I mean, that's uh, uh, um, or getting the job done. That's 20 minutes I could be used uh, doing something else. That's why I put on the bottom there: the greater the DPI, the higher quality of the print. But in parentheses, depending on the substrate. Depends on what you're printing on. For garments, 600 by 600, 1200 by 600, more than sufficient. So that's DPI in a nutshell. I hope I covered that well enough so that we all understand it. Now, another major piece. So we, we talked about the print head and what DPI means. But now we're, let's talk about the maintenance station. The maintenance station or capping station, depending on who you talk to, there's multiple names for it. It has a lot of purposes, but the most important are is that it seals off the tip of the print head when it's not in use. That way, no dust, air, anything can touch this ink, right? Or the tips of the print head. It also is used to 
draw ink out of the printhead when it does like a clean or something along those lines. Uh, or when you're filling your printer for the first time, what you'll notice is that the printhead will be sitting over the uh, maintenance station and it'll be, uh, there's a pump below the maintenance station that's just sucking the ink, really the air out of the lines and drawing ink into it. It also has the ability to, uh, there's a wiper blade next to the maintenance station uh, that's part of it, and it wipes the tip of the print head off, ensuring that your print head is ready to start printing. Recall that I mentioned that the white ink is very, um, uh, has two major, two properties that we need to be aware of. The first one is, is that it, as soon as it comes in contact with air, it starts to dry and thicken a lot faster than uh, regular CMYK would. Uh, and then the other one is that it, it settles. Well, if your maintenance station and these seals that you see here around your maintenance station are free of ink and free of any obstruction and your print head can sit over the maintenance station comfortably and seal off the tip of the print head, it's ensuring that we're preventing any of that air, dust, contaminants, anything from com the one coming into contact with, with the uh, maintenance station, but we're also keeping the maintenance station and the tips of the print heads moist, wet. We need to keep that wet. One of the main issues in all of direct to garment printing is the 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 lack of attention to this fine piece of direct garment printing, okay? If your seals around your maintenance station are compromised in any way, maybe a piece of fiber is on there or, or ink has dried up on the seals and preventing it from getting a good seal when the, when the print head is, is sitting over it, it is going to prevent you from getting a good nozzle check and getting a good uh, print. <coughs> Excuse me again, I apologize. It is so critical that that seal is nice and clean because it can now sit flush with the top, with the tip of the print head. And when the tip of the print head is sitting flush, it keeps things moist. It doesn't allow any air to come into the, uh, to touch the tip of the print head, which prevents the air from drying out any of the ink that's on the tip of the print head, because there is residual ink that is left there. Um, and it ensures that you're going to, that when you come in and you're ready to start printing, you don't have to go through very a lot of cleaning stages to keep it going. So the maintenance station is a pretty critical piece of your, uh, uh, of your printer. Uh, that's why I wanted to make sure I segmented it here. And in my opinion, it's, it's really probably the, and that's why I put it second, it's the second most important piece next to your printhead. Um, if you have a good, if you have a good proper seal every time, uh, you're never really going to have any issues with your printer and, the, print, and the, the actual printing that goes on. Okay. Now, lines and dampers, what are those? Okay, so we have to find a way for the ink to travel from the cartridge to the print head. The diagram you see in front of you is from our Empower 10, and it's the ink flow of our cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. I'll show you the white one in just a second. But you can see that from this black cartridge right here, the line goes down into a damper, actually comes into this damper as well. It fills this damper up. Let me stop real quickly. A damper is essentially a reservoir for ink. It's a way for us to regulate pressure, but also build up enough ink in the, in the line or in the reservoir to be used to print a, the amount of ink that is needed for the garment, okay? It's not a direct feed. If we didn't have the dampers, these pieces right here, 
what would happen would is that at the bottom of the print head, here's your print head. At the bottom of the print head, you would just leak black ink because there's no way to regulate the pressure. The dampers are there to help us do that. It helps regulate the pressure to prevent it from leaking, but also we fill up the damper with enough ink so that it has enough ink to print the print that you want it to do. And your dampers refill constantly, are refilling naturally. They just do it because of the pressure regulation. So the black ink goes through the line, goes into your damper, and then the damper attaches to this print head in the front and in the back. Okay, Back to where the ink comes up, and then the print head takes that ink, fires the appropriate amount of dots down onto the garment to get the desired look that you're wanting to do. And it does this for your black, your yellow, your magenta, and your cyan. All right. It takes those four colors and those four print heads and all of those dampers and lays down the dots appropriately so that you get the desired color that you want. All right. Now the next part of this, which I think is going to be pretty uh, 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 critical. I'm sorry. Is the white ink damper line, lines and dampers for white. This is where things get a little bit more complicated, call it. Okay. Now remember when I mentioned that the white ink has um, two properties we need to be aware of. It can dry out, right? So we don't want any air, no dust, nothing touching the ink until it's out under the shirt, right? Well, we take care of that by maintaining the maintenance station and making sure we have that tight seal. Okay, But the other piece is, is that it settles. So when you're not using it, the ink starts to separate, the titanium dioxide sinks in the lines, and in turn, you have what looks like, if you opened up a printer, it looks almost milky instead of bright white. This is where, and this is for Anajet. Not everybody has this, but this is for us. I'm trying to keep this somewhat, uh, um, you know, I, I don't want to just Anajet, 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 but I, I, I do want you to understand kind of some of the technology that we've done. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible, but. I can only do so much. I am a I am an antigen employee, right? But in any case, we've set up a circulatory system in the printer. All right. Now what this means is is this prevents the white ink from settling. So that means that you don't have to use it. Now in the past, before this technology was developed, we would tell our customers that you have to use your printer every day. Well, the reason they had to use their printer every day was to prevent the white ink from settling and to making sure that your white ink was flowing properly and it was at the consistency and mix that you needed it to be at at all times. Well, now with the Empower series, we took that out of your hands and you don't have to do that. You don't have to use it uh, 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 daily. Now, every hour, when the printer is not being used, there are pumps, and they're placed right here. We call them bi-directional pumps. And what these pumps do is they circulate the ink down into the damper, back out, back onto itself where the pump is, and it goes in a big loop like this. So. You don't use your printer for a day. No big deal. Don't use it for a few days. Not a problem. As long as the seal on your maintenance station is nice and fresh and there's no obstruction, that means you're preventing any air from coming into contact with that white ink, preventing it from drying, and your printer is left on so that every hour when it's not being used, the white ink can circulate and by circulating it, I'm mixing it up 
right? It's kind of like a, um, a cement truck. You see a cement truck driving down the road and you see it spinning. That means it's got cement in the back of it and it's keeping it from setting, right? Same kind of idea. We're keeping the ink mixed up. We're keeping it at the uh, viscosity levels that we want. We're keeping it all uh, the the titan we're preventing the titanium dioxide from settling. We're keeping it nice and good, nice and going, uh, 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 nice and smooth, so that when we do print, um, we have the white consistency that we want. Uh, so we go in a big circle on each head. So there's extra lines, and you'll actually see it with your anajet. You open it up, and you'll notice that there's you would think there's two white cartridges. There should be two sets of lines. Well, there's not. There's four sets of lines because one is the print line, and the other is the purge line. And the purge line we've named is the line that takes the white ink back and circulates it on itself using this pump. So that's the technology. When faced with printing with white ink, and I, I, if, if any of you have had experience in direct garment printing in the last five years, you've probably heard this one way or another. That the whiting clogs, or this happens this way. The reason why it clogs are those two properties that I mentioned. That the maintenance station isn't getting a correct seal with the tip of the printhead, causing the introduction of air, dust, any type of contaminant that can cause the whiting to thicken and harden, and lack of use of the printer before this pump system was developed was causing the whiting to settle. And to get solid whites, the only way to get solid whites was to shake your whiting cartridge up, put it back in the printer, and get rid of all the ink that was in these lines get rid of all of the ink that was in these lines that is no longer usable and get brand new ink out of your white cartridge. Now with the pump, that's not the problem anymore. Now your white ink is maintaining the circuit, maintaining the correct uh, uh, mix at all times. And as long as your maintenance station is clean and it's, uh, it's getting a good seal, you don't have those problems. I have to stress, literally, 95% of our tech calls before we came out with this process, 90 plus percent easy, were revolving around those two properties. And it's one of the main reasons why I wanted to have this webinar today because I wanted people to be aware, and we're planning on using this uh, uh, to help with other customers as well, but I wanted people to be aware that those are the two reasons and the two things that you have to keep an eye out for when it comes to white ink. And here's what we've done to fix one of them so that you don't have to worry about it. And for the other one, just make sure your seals are tight. Make sure that those seals look like they're brand new. And I tell my customers to do that all the time. When you get your printer, your, the, the seals on your maintenance station are going to look just beautiful, brand new. Every time you look at them, if they don't look brand new, wipe them and, and clean them off, make them look brand new again. It takes two seconds, but it'll save you all sorts of heartache if you do that. All right, so just a really brief recap with the white, the ink cartridge goes into the valve needle through the lines into the damper. Again, it saves the, it puts enough white ink into the, uh, into the damper uh, to use for the ink. And if you're printing, it goes right out the print head. If you're not printing, it comes right back into your other set of purge lines. And using this bi-directional pump, we pump the ink in a circle. So it's a circulatory system over and over and over again. That way, when you don't use it, you don't have to worry about your white ink. Now, preventative maintenance. I feel like I'm. You guys, maybe you guys are going to be tired of me saying this, but it, but it again, it all comes back to the white ink. If you just had, just to take a, a quick side note, if you just had cyan, magenta, yellow, and black in the printer, it would be as easy as running your desktop printer. 
cyan, magenta, yellow, black are the easiest things to keep maintained. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. They're, they're, they're a cakewalk. It's the white ink that has the issues, right, because of those two properties that I mentioned. Now, all direct garment printers require preventative maintenance, some more than others depending on the quality of the components and their ink delivery system. The circulatory system, for example, reduces the amount of maintenance that you need to do on the printer. But all direct garment printers require some sort of, of preventative maintenance. Some of it, if they don't have the circulatory system, it's once a day. Like I mentioned before, you have to use it every day. Some of it, like with Anajet, it's once a week. Okay. Right below that picture that you see there, that is the top of a maintenance station. And you can see here, here's my black seals right here. What we ask you to do is once a week, you clean around the seals on the maintenance station. We give you a little cleaning applicator. We give you um, uh, some cleaning solution, although you may not need to use it. Um, and you take that little cleaning applicator and you clean any excess ink buildup, any fuzz, any anything that got right around these seals. And like I mentioned before, I tell my customers, just make it look like it did right when you pulled it out of the box. Make it look brand new, and you'll be in good shape. In all reality, this takes you five minutes. But be thorough. Don't, you know, if, if you can do it in two minutes, take the extra minute and do it a little bit more. It's only a little bit of extra time. But it ensures that you're going to get consistent, high-quality prints all the time because it's making sure that I'm getting that good, solid ink flow. Right. So once a week, clean around your seals. Now the only time I would say that you would want to do this more than once a week is if you were doing if you were printing, say, call it a thousand shirts in a day. If you were printing a thousand shirts a day with the machine, then you know maybe do this right before you start every day. Again, it just takes a couple minutes. But if you're printing 50 shirts today and 20 shirts tomorrow, and then on Friday you're going to print 40 more shirts, then at the end of every week, clean around those seals and make sure that it, there's no ink buildup. There does become a point where usage is important. Right? Now they say a good example of this is, a, is the car analogy. They say you know you get an get an oil change every 3,000 miles, or every three to five months. Even if you only drive a thousand miles every three to five months, you want to make sure that you're getting that oil out of there and putting in some good stuff. Or if you do, but if you drive that 3,000 miles in a week, then you need to get an oil change every week. And that's kind of the idea. So once a week, clean around your maintenance station, clean around uh, those seals, make sure it looks really nice and good. And then if the only time you would want to do it more, is if you are really just printing on that thing eight, ten hours a day, then I would recommend giving it a little bit more uh, attention, a little extra love. Also with preventative maintenance, there's a wiper blade. Now, I'm going to go back to the previous slide just real quickly. Right here, you don't see it on this screen, but right here is where your wiper blade mechanism is. And that's where it pops up. Now the wiper blade is very similar to the material that's on your windshield wipers. But what it does is it wipes off the bottom of the print head so that it's nice and shiny like you see here. Okay. One common thing that we see is that when maintenance stations aren't clean, there's a lot of ink residue around what we call the nozzle plate. That's this right here. There's ink residue around each print head. Okay? And then when the wiper blade comes and goes across the print head, it takes the ink residue that is around the print head and smears it on the other print heads. Makes sense, right? I mean, have you, uh, not to be a little gross here, but have you ever used your windshield wipers when a bird 
had a, you know, went to the bathroom on your windshield and the windshield wipers just smear it across your windshield without using some kind of water. Well, that's essentially what I'm talking about here. You want to clean off your wiper blade as well because it, it also can accumulate ink buildup on it. The ink can dry on it, right? Because it's not being sealed off. So in addition to that once a week cleaning around your seals, you also want to clean off the tip of your wiper blade to make sure that if there's any extra ink that's on the wiper blade that it's not smearing across your print heads. And that if there is any little you know, uh, uh, extra buildup on the, the printhead itself, that the wiper blade's making sure that it takes care of it. The other piece is the nozzle plate, right here. Now, our print heads are pretty industrial, meaning, just to kind of put it in, in perspective, the, the printers that we manufactured back in uh, Wow, it seems like a lot longer than it actually was. Back in like 08, 09, 2010, <clears throat> 2011 even, the printheads were very, very sensitive. Uh, so much so that if you touched the where the ink comes out of the printhead, you, you basically just damaged your printhead and you needed to replace it brand new. Well, now these printheads are much more industrial, much more commercial grade, much stronger. So it's okay to touch the bottom of the printhead not going to be the end of the world. But what we'd like you to do is, because we have the 6 or in the MP5 3, what happens is ink will build up in between them as you print. And if there's any ink residue on your wiper blade or any ink residue on your maintenance station, that can transfer over onto your nozzle plate. So in addition to cleaning off your maintenance station and your wiper blade, Take a synthetic wipe with some cleaning solution that we provide and wipe the bottom of your print head. Make sure that all the ink residue is off and that it looks just like this. If it looks like this and your wiper blade looks like that and your maintenance station looks like that, you're never going to have a problem. The printer's going to print just like you want it to print. But if this part is neglected, it can snowball into other things. Not only can it clog your print head, which is the most important piece as we now learn, but it'll you'll actually end up wasting shirts because you'll you'll have a hard time getting a high quality print. But this preventative maintenance and, and folks, this takes, even if you're as thorough as can be, ten minutes a week. I don't even care if you don't use the printer all week. Do this preventative maintenance every week, 10 minutes. That's all it takes. You do that, and you'll never have a problem with the printer. It'll print exactly as advertised, and you'll get high-quality prints, and you'll be happy with it. But if you neglect it and you don't care for it, you're going to run into other problems. If there's anything I can take you, the, if there's anything you can take away from this, the preventative maintenance there is critical. Okay. Clean off that maintenance station, make it look shiny and brand new. Clean off your wiper blade and clean the bottom of your nozzle plate. Take the 10 minutes out, you'll be good to go. All right. Now, that is, I know, a lot of information. And I can see that a lot of people have asked a bunch of questions. So what I'd like to do, um, and I'm at the Q&A session. Okay, perfect. First things first. Thank you for jumping on. Anybody that is on this webinar um, automatically gets preferred pricing at Anichet. Um, so if you are interested in a printer or you talk to somebody about uh, a direct garment printer here at Anichet, please do me a favor and um, and reach out to them and they will give you special pricing. So the fact that you logged on means that you already qualify for a discount. I'm talking about saving almost $10,000. So please reach out to our, the, the, the right person here. And if you don't know who that person is, you can email me directly. Uh, my email address is A as in Adam, T as in Tom, I, P as in Paul, R as in Robert, E as in Edward, at 
anajet.com. So A-T-I-P-R-E at anajet.com, and I'll put you in contact with the right person. But let's dive into this Q&A here. Uh, question one, so what DPI do I recommend? You know, that's a really good question. So typically, um, we have, we named our DPI different things on our printer. We named it uh, speed, fine, and super fine. And speed is 600 by 600, and fine is 1200 by 600, and super fine is 1200 by 1200. We default to 1200 by 600 because at that rate, you can put anything you want in there and you're going to get what you want, even if you kind of neglect your maintenance a little bit. Because remember, the more dots I put, the more potential it is to cover up any imperfections, right? Um, so 1200 by 600 pretty much guarantees you're going to do what you want to do. Now, if you're maintaining your printer and everything is, is running good, I don't see why you don't print at 600 by 600 because you'll get the same quality print um, and it'll be faster. So at some point it becomes what your preference is and how much your how well you're taking care of your printer. <coughs> Like I mentioned, we do 1200 by 600 just because it, it 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 makes it so that nobody has any problems and you can print, print, print to your heart's content. It's just going to take you longer. It doesn't use any more ink. That's another thing I want to point out. 600 by 600, 1200 by 600 uses the same amount of ink. Uh, it's just how it lays the drops down. Okay. Question two is, do maintenance costs more money in ink? Right. Doing maintenance costs more money in ink? Right. Okay. Good question. Um, for the preventative maintenance that I just discussed with you right now, no. No. Uh, cleaning around your maintenance station, cleaning off your um, uh, wiper blade, cleaning uh, the tip of your printhead doesn't cost you anything. In ink. Uh, all it is, you're not pushing any ink out of the printhead doing that, so it's zero. But the caveat here is that if that maintenance isn't done, if that preventative maintenance isn't done, you end up having to do more head cleans, which and head cleans cost you ink. Now it's minimal, you know, call it, you know, 25 cents to, you know, 75 cents every time you do a head clean. It's, it's, it's pretty insignificant. Um, but if you had to do a lot of those because the preventative maintenance wasn't being done, that can add up. All right. Now the printhead does have a auto head clean. It does every day. It'll do it uh, once at one time, um, and that's and and it's that's intended to ensure that we're you know pushing just a little bit of ink out of the tip of the print head to keep it nice and moist. Okay, so the, your your maintenance cost may be only twenty five cents a day, pretty insignificant, but it's uh, it's something that we do uh, have. But preventative maintenance wise. If you're taking care of your, your, your machine, your wiper blade, your tip of your print head, and your maintenance station, you really only should, maintenance cost should be that once a day head clean that it automatically does. Okay? Uh, question three, uh, where is the maintenance station? Okay, so the maintenance station, if you're facing the printer, it's on. It's at the the closest to you on the left hand side, and it's where the print head rests when it's not being used. Okay, so if you walked up to your printer, opened up the hood, and saw on the left hand side, you would see the print head, and right below it would be the maintenance station, and that's where it's supposed to sit. And really, you have very easy access to it, so it's not like something you have to climb into the printer to clean this area. It's very easy to see. Um, but again, like I said, it's it's pretty critical to make sure because when, like I said, when you're not there, that's where it's resting all the time. So if that maintenance station isn't clean, that print head is resting uh, without a not on top of a clean maintenance station, which is going to cause you trouble. And if you walk away for a few days and you are bringing in air or dust can get in there, or, and if you don't have a tight seal, you're going to have problems. Uh, next one is, sounds like you're recommending a humidifier. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is um, this is something that is, uh, you know, humidity is always important. 
okay, let me put it to you this way. We have water-based inks. All right. When it's dry, water evaporates faster than when it's humid. Okay? And that's just the physics of our world. That's, that happens. I mean, you look at a puddle. A puddle doesn't last as long in Albuquerque, New Mexico, than it does in uh, you know, Miami, Florida. Okay? The reason being is because of the humidity level in the air. And that's, that's essentially what I'm talking about when, they talk, when, they, when we discuss humidity. Okay? So we've taken steps. Anna Jettis, and with the, with the help of Rico, we've taken steps to fix, uh, uh, not fix isn't the right word, but to uh, make humidity not as important as it used to be. Um, we've uh, put in different lines and dampers uh, into the printer that are less permeable, uh, which means that the, the, the water that's in the lines, uh, the water-based ink and the water that's in the line can escape through the lines, can't evaporate through those lines. Remember, we're talking about, you know, on microscopic levels here, right? The atoms, that's, the, that's, what we're, that's the size. Um, so the lines are less permeable. That helps pretty significantly. Um, it prevents the, uh, the water from evaporating, which just leaves the pigment, and when you just leave the pigment, you get this thick, gooey stuff. So that's a, that's a pretty big win for us. Um, where humidity is going to be an issue for you is if you are in a desert climate or you're in an area that seasonally is dry, right? Um, and get a humidifier. They're 100 bucks at Home Depot if you're worried about it. Stick it right next to the printer and you'll never have a problem. Okay, we're in Southern California, which for the most of the part is pretty much a dry climate. And we have humidifiers. Then again, we'll go to shows in all over the place, but in, most notably in like Las Vegas, where there's 5% humidity, and we run and don't really have a problem. Um, but we would run more efficiently. We would do less cleanings. We would just be overall get more out of our ink if we had a more humid environment because we wouldn't have as much water evaporation. So it's a good idea to have a good humid environment. Um, but it, uh, it's something that it, it's important to understand why um, and, and, and to know that, you know, if you're sitting, and there's a, a lot of places across the U.S. that are 40% your humidity or higher, I would encourage you to check your, your local area right now, um, and that's pretty much year-round. Well, you know, for that, you don't need a humidifier. Your humidity range is more than enough. It's when you get down to the, you know, the low single digit teens, even in the 20s, that's when it starts, you go, you know, maybe I should put a humidifier here uh, just because it'll, it'll help with the ink flow and the way that the, uh, the whole process works. Um, and, you know, another piece of this, if you're doing your preventative maintenance, humidity isn't as big of an issue. So keep harping back on that, I know. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Oh, uh, I, I mentioned about the, the next question, what, but does that mean you still don't shake the cartridges? Um, I mentioned that, you, you know, in the past you had to um, uh, do the white ink um, and shake your cartridge uh, to get the white ink to mix up. Yeah, you know, realistically, you probably should, part of your preventive maintenance, that 10 minutes that I was talking about, take your white ink cartridges, pull them out, give them a good shake, pop them right back in. The thing is, is that as soon as that ink gets put right back into the system, the circulation system is going to mix it up to the levels that you need it to be at anyway. So uh, it doesn't hurt to shake it. Um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, again, all of this stuff is, it's, it's like, you know, all do this stuff because it's better to do it, not because, oh, that's a chore. I mean, it's, it, this is simple stuff that we have to do to just make sure that everything is, is running smooth. And again, across all you know, garment printing. We all, I, you know, that's a big secret here in the direct garment ink industry. Um, not all ink is the same, and some ink is higher quality than other ink, but for the most part, the chemistry is the same. Right? If I took every ink in that was, that was out there, 
that is developed for directed carbon printing. 90% of it is the exact same. 10% of it is where the changes are made. Um, sometimes they're it's the uh, lower quality uh, uh, components, things like that. But for the most part, the chemistry is the same. So we all run across these same hurdles, right? The lighting separating and the lighting coming into contact with air and drying out. We all run across those same hurdles. It's what we do about it that is is the key thing here. Uh, next one is uh, when the print is not being routinely used, the maintenance instructions has caused for 50% loss of ink in a three-week period. Is this normal to lose 50% of the ink performing routinely maintenance? Um, I don't know specific. That's, uh, it seems a little vague. I'm trying to think about. So if you're not using the printer, maintenance. I mean, if you're not using the printer over a three-week period, the only time I'm type of maintenance that is actually getting done is your preventative maintenance which doesn't waste any ink and then the once a day head, the once a day, uh, head cleaning. Um, the one thing that I will say to you though just so that you're aware um, you can put a cartridge in the machine fill up your entire printer and exhaust probably 70 percent of that cartridge depending on the size of the cartridge. Um, if you open up the, our printer specifically, not every printer is like this, but we have a lot of lines and ink always in the lines. We do that on purpose uh, because we want the circulatory system to, to have it, right? So, <clears throat> so that may be what you're referring to. I'm not 100% sure, um, but I have a better time kind of following that. Um, next one is, uh, does the MP5 have the white ink pumps? Um, tech support tells me to shake the white cartridges every day. So again yes the the mp5 does have the whiting pumps yeah it does so for example you have two lines going to one print head uh, for your whiting channels and two additional lines that are circulating on it so um, shaking the whiting cartridges every day is uh, in my humble opinion it is probably overkill but you know what the uh, the guys here at uh, um, uh, in our support department um, they're probably sitting back going, let's cover every base if we're doing some diagnostics, right? So it's like when the doctor, when you go into a doctor's office and you say your throat hurts, well, there's probably 20 different things that can cause your throat to hurt. So what they're doing is they're, you're saying something's happening and there are probably 20 different things that can cause it. So they're just going, okay, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? They're, they're you know, crossing things off the list, so to speak. And one of them is like, okay, shake your cartridges every day. It's probably a little overkill to be honest with you. Uh, if the seals start to look cracked on the maintenance station, are, um, I'm sure they need to be replaced. That, that's very possible. That's very possible. And over prolonged use, that's gonna happen. So that, that's something to, Definitely reach out to our, our customer care um, or our support team about to make sure that we're getting you um, a good seal. Now, uh, the best bet is probably just to get us a, a picture of some sort or something that we can we can you know visibly see it. It may not be that they need to, um, but because uh, the, the seals are pretty, um, they're a little higher, they're a little overkill, so uh, a little bit of cracking isn't the end of the world. Um, in fact, it's, it's designed to have that kind of tolerance. Uh, question eight, could you touch on what to clean the maintenance station with versus using the entire bottle? Of, uh, yeah, you know, <coughs> the, the, the question really is, can I use other things besides the cleaning solution in, um, on the uh, tips of the printhead? You know, we recommend the cleaning solution. Um, I've seen people clean it with a lot of different things, uh, but we have to be aware that uh, the cleaning solution is, is, is made in a way that we know for a fact it's not going to affect the printhead. Um, if you shouldn't be using an entire bottle of cleaning solution to clean uh, uh, your maintenance station, uh, at least not in one sitting. Uh, if you are, there's, you, we need to kind of review the maintenance procedures. Um, at most, I take a synthetic wipe, I take my little cleaning solution bottle, I dab 
some cleaning solution on the tip of it, and that's what I use to wipe. And um, I, I usually get through maybe, I would say, I don't even know how much, but a cap full of cleaning solution uh, for each time I clean, maybe a little bit more. Um, and I would recommend using our cleaning solution um, uh, just because it's 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 something that uh, um, uh, it's in our manual and in our and our print heads. We know that it's not going to damage anything. I have seen customers use hot distilled water that you are mentioning now. Uh, could you talk about cleaning the print head plate? I always worry about hurting the print head. Um, I typically, the way I do it is I take a, um, a cleaning solution, like I said, and I, I kind of I dab it on a synthetic wipe. And then I take that synthetic wipe and I wipe from back to front. Then I take the other side of the synthetic wipe, put a little bit more cleaning solution on it, and back to front until I get all that area done. Then I take at the very end a little bit of a synthetic wipe, and I, but without any cleaning solution on it, and I just kind of wipe everything nice and clean and see if I missed anything. Again, if I'm thorough, this whole process, maintenance station, tip of the print head, wipe the blade, takes me about 10 minutes. You shouldn't have to, don't worry about hurting the print heads, by the way. I don't know that back yet. The print heads are, are, are pretty sturdy. As long as you're doing the, using our, our solution, I, I have no qualms about you. You're not going to hurt the printhead. Uh, please talk about what to do if you have not done this and have some buildup. Maybe a video on removing the plate. I wiped mine to what I thought was a lot and still had some buildup that took me some time to get clean. You know, a good, good point. And 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 don't feel alone, um, whoever answered that question, because that happens often, and it's one of the reasons why I'm doing this webinar. Um, you may have to take a little bit of extra time if you haven't been as thorough as you should have been. You may you may have to take a little bit of extra time and, and really clean in between the print heads and really get that nozzle plate nice and clean. Use use more cleaning solution than you actually needed to. Um, and the best thing I can do is a, a video is a good idea. And, and I I think we may have something um, or something maybe being made um, that kind of shows what to do. But I I think it's it's pretty critical that you try to do your best to clean that. Now, if you're having a concern or or, or you feel like the cleaning solution isn't isn't building up uh, enough uh, to get rid of that ink residue, I would recommend you call our support department and talk to them specifically about you wanting to make sure that that is clean. There are ways that you can actually soak uh, the print head. Uh, and the maintenance station that can help build up, break up that excess ink that didn't get cleaned off over weeks or months or however long. And um, and then there's also, uh, they may have some other tricks of the trade that will help do that. But I'm so glad you brought that up because if you've been having printing issues, it, that's probably your cause. If, if you see a, a lot of buildup on the bottom, that's probably where it's coming from. Uh, future of inks, neon metallic effect, glow in the dark. Can they be made with Anajet? Typical life of a printhead. I have a lot of questions. All right, so future of inks. Yes, there is a lot of really cool stuff that we're working on. A lot of different uh, uh, neon colors and different things like that. And as soon as we feel comfortable with uh, launching it and we're getting the results that we want, uh, we'll, we'll be sending it out to you. <coughs> Excuse me. The metallic effect, we have that foil. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, Contact your regional manager. He'll let you know about it. It's uh, uh, you apply it after you print, and it gives it a metallic look. Uh, it's really kind of cool. Um, and then the typical life of a printhead. You know, it's it, that's it, it's tough to say because it's it's how well you you um, you take care of it, right? So for to, to use the same analogy to keep the car analogy going, you know, um, if you drove your car on those tires and you drove the speed limit every day and didn't accelerate too fast or brake too hard, those tires are going to last longer than if you gunned it and or slammed on your brakes uh, and burnt rubber, right? And that's kind of the same thing with printheads. If you take care of them and you do your preventative maintenance, they're going to last longer than if you don't. Um, I would say totally comfortably saying 30 plus thousand prints is, is uh, per printhead is very easy to to, to hit, especially with the uh, um, 
the strength of these printheads. Uh, question 12, what do you recommend the pretreatment be for both white and dark garments? Okay, good question. So on white, I don't pretreat. You can put a light mist spray of pretreat on it, and um, it does help with the vibrancy of some colors. So if you want to do that, go ahead. I typically don't, never needed to. Um, then again, I'm Again, going back, my preventative maintenance is being done correctly, and I'm getting, I'm firing all my nozzles, so that may be a, a reason why you feel like the print isn't looking as good. But if you put a little pretreatment on it, it looks better, um, and that's fine. But do a very light amount. Don't do as much as a dark garment. That's just a waste of pretreatment. Um, for dark garments, I, uh, I, a lot of it is the type of garment um, that I'm printing on, the thickness of it. Um, for example, if I'm doing um, like a standard Gildan, uh, what is it, the P, uh, I can't recall the specific one it is, but um, <coughs> I'll do, if you don't get the pre-mixed stuff from us, um, I typically do like 50-50, um, concentrate to uh, distilled water. Um, I've seen people go as far as two-thirds pre-treat to one-third water. Um, Again, though, if you're it, it, that just depends on the shirt. If you're um, if you feel like your white isn't vibrant enough, it may not be the pretreat. It may be because the uh, your white not heads aren't firing correctly, and that's because of preventative maintenance. So um, take a, take some time and and make sure you got a good nozzle check. Print your your image, and if you you were like, man, I need just a little bit more white or you want to see a little more opaqueness, increase the amount of pretreat and decrease the amount of distilled water and you'll get what you want. Um, yeah, uh, so you just had an FB125 refurbished by, you know, that's one of our, that's the first printer we ever manufactured. Um, started using it this week for the first time. It was recommended I only load the CMYK, leave cleaning cartridges in the white base until I've had some time with the printer. Is it okay? Yes. Yes, it is okay. And the reason why they recommended that is because CMYK, like I was mentioning before, is uh, almost, it, it's very, very tough to clog a CMYK channel's head. Um, it, the, it's the easiest ink that's out there. <coughs> and the FP125, it was built. I mean, we started manufacturing that in 2008, and that was way before we had the circulation system on the white channels. And so what they are doing, essentially, is saying, just print CMYK so that you get good with it. Once you feel comfortable and that you're good with printing, then put in the white ink. And then when you put in the white ink, make sure that you know you got to use it every day. With the Empower, that wouldn't be the case, but with an old FP125, that's the case. Uh, question 14 is how often do you replace the wipers? That's a really good question. It's, usage is the main thing. If you're if you're using it, I I would say once a month on average, most customers do. But again, if you're printing a thousand shirts a day, I mean the wipers are pennies, right? So if you if you have a concern with it, it's better to just have a few on hand and you go, you know what? Let me just put the correct wiper in, um, just to be safe. It, it doesn't hurt. They're they're very uh, low cost items intentionally. Um, MP5, curious to know the cost to fill it with ink. Okay, so uh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head, but I can do some quick math. Um, it's likely that when you put in a 220 milliliter cartridge in an MP5 that you are filling up, probably you're probably losing about, uh, call it 70% of the cartridge. Um, maybe not that much, maybe 60% of the cartridge. Um, so take the cost of uh, an uh, 220 milliliter cyan cartridge, 60% of it, uh, and then there's your there's your cost. Again, that but that's not sunk cost. That's ink that you're going to be using to print, right? So keep that in mind. Um, are these areas all readily accessible without disassembly? Yes, all those areas are right there in front of you, so it's super easy to get to. So you shouldn't have a problem at all with getting that. Um, how often should I flush the printer? Uh, I'm going to refer you back to, depending, I don't know which printer you have, one, but I'm going to refer you back to kind of support, but 
right now, we like ink in the machine. We've gone as far as having ink ship or having printers uh, that uh, have come back to us with ink still in them. So I like ink in the machine, uh, but follow the, uh, the manual and you'll be in good shape. So if you're printing and run out of ink during a print, do you have a warning beforehand, or is there an indicator? Well, yes, yes, there is a warning beforehand, and 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 you'll know. You can actually gauge how much ink is in each cartridge down to the percent, and it's going to notify you if you're low, um, so that that doesn't happen. And in some cases, depending on if you have the the right settings, there are a few different settings in the in the uh, um, uh, control panel. Um, but depending on if you have the right settings, it won't even let you print unless it tells you, hey, you need to replace the ink cartridges. So it's a way for us to prevent you from having to have, uh, you know, draw air into the system. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, there are safety uh, procedures put in place for that. Uh, this machine is a beast. So probably difficult to get through the front door. Is it okay to still move on the side to get it in the door? Yeah, for uh, um, if you're bringing it in for the first day, yeah, no problem. Really, no, no inks in there. Uh, just make sure there's a uh, waste ink tank that uh, is shipped. It comes. It's in the back. Um, just make sure that that's empty so that whatever's in there doesn't spill out and you'll be in good shape. Also, make sure that the print head and the uh, table. Uh, there's brackets that come with the printer when you first get it. Um, that hold the print head and table in place. Um, so go ahead and, and do that. Uh, as long as those are there, you're, you'll be fine. <coughs> but real quickly, just back to that. Um, there is a setup procedure that has to do with leveling the printer and making sure that everything is 100% um, correct because, you know, however much we love these shipping companies, um, they can kind of get jostled around in the back of a truck or something. So part of the setup procedure is leveling the printer, and there's a few extra steps. Uh, you want to make sure that those steps are completed before you uh, start printing or put ink into the system. It's all in the user manual, and of course our support personnel is here to help you with any of those questions. Uh, do I ever see making the software Mac compatible? Yeah, it's already it's in process. So hopefully soon for you, um, but we were in the process of uh, uh, working on it as we speak. Um, if you have, so if, if you find some, so we're, we're going to have a new store for you guys. I'm, uh, we got a question about replacing certain components in the printer. If you have a, an immediate need, contact our customer care or our support department and they can get you what you need if you, if you see something that's not on the store. We have a new website and store that's coming here in the next probably 30 days. Um, that is going to be a lot easier to navigate and a lot easier to get through it um, so that you can go direct to the store. But I have noticed a few customers coming to me saying, man, I, I'm trying to find this and I can't find it. And so I understand it's getting worked out, but in the meantime, just call our team here and they'll get you what you need. Uh, when pre-treating a dark color shirt, the pre-treat leaves a dark area when done drying. Is there any way to get it? So on certain color shirts, uh, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, like red, for example, you can actually see an outline of the pre-treat a little bit. So there's two ways to get rid of that. Um, one, you can just, again, this is a industry-wide thing. This happens all printing, right? Um, as soon as you wash it, that pre-treat is gone, so you won't be able to see it. That's one. Um, two, uh, if you spray, <coughs> excuse me. If you spray a little bit of water on the outside and kind of feather it out towards the edge, it uh, dilutes it so that you can't see it, and that'll get rid of it. Um, it takes a little bit of extra step, but it's one way to do it if you have customers that are a little nit nitpicky about it. Um, most colored shirts, you don't really see it, although with shirts that have a lot of red or magenta in them, um, like oranges, um, maybe some yellows, red, they, I, I do see it. Uh, is the circulation updates on only the new models or software updates are doing this on older machines? Yeah, good question. So all the, uh, um, we're actually, we'll have some, we just launched new firmware and software, uh, say, say it was a couple months ago, um, and that works backwards to uh, 
the older machines. So you'll be able to download that if you haven't already, and it'll have all the correct circulation timing and all that stuff. Um, and keep in mind, all firmware, software, everything that anytime we come out with something new, um, it's yours. We don't charge you for it. It's free. These updates are free for you. Um, we make sure that that's the case. And and and, and in, it, depending on how old your machine is, um, uh, all of those firmware and software updates are compatible. The only time it wouldn't be is if it wasn't an Empower series, like a like if it was a Sprint or an FB125. Uh, those firmwares don't apply. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, okay. Are there certain graphics that cannot be interpreted by software and capable of printing? For example, high definition images, engineering blueprint images with thin stroke lines, shades of black, and grayscale ink, different contrast. All right. Good question. So, you know, that's something that you need to kind of be aware of, right? So, um, High definition images that are it's it, it's all what it's meant to be printed on and the size of the image. For example, uh, have you seen those big posters that hang on the side of buildings? Like if you go to downtown LA or New York, see pictures of it, you see like this huge poster, right? Well, that image is developed and has the high resolution to be an image of that size. Conversely. Have you ever seen a very low quality graphic um, that as soon as you tried to blow it up and make it big, it got all pixelated? It looked like it was uh, uh, just a bunch of square boxes. Um, that's a low quality image that was in initially designed to be for something that size, that maybe one inch by one inch. That's how you need to look at it. Now, if I take that huge image that is supposed to be on the side of a building and compress it down to the size of something that's going to be 12 by 12 inches. I'm going to get the result <coughs> for the most part that I want. But I'll probably lose some detail. I'll probably lose some detail. Not just because I'm making it smaller, but because I'm printing on a shirt as opposed to a piece of paper or a poster board of some sort, right? Because remember in the, in the DPI, once that drop hits, it starts to spread out a little bit. So you may lose some of that detail. You may that, 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 is, that is totally possible, especially if you're taking something that is very high and making it really small. So super fine, thin font. And I'm talking about font the size of <coughs> um, the eye on your keyboard, right? That font, if you look at your keyboard in front of you, I'm assuming we're all sitting in front of a computer. But there's an I, you know, the that font I can I can get on a shirt. I go any smaller than that, and I may actually end up losing a little bit of definition. Right? Because we gotta remember it's a shirt. Now if I was printing on a piece of paper, I could get it no problem. Same printer, same everything. I could have no problem getting it. It's the sh it's the substrate that I'm printing on that you end up losing sometimes. Right? Now the rip also just so that you're all aware, you may have to convert it to a different file type to have the RIP accepted. I run across this for people that use CorelDRAW as their software. Okay, You can't put a CorelDRAW file into our RIP. It won't read it. But you can convert the CorelDRAW file to a PNG or a TIFF or a JPEG, drop it into the RIP, and you'll be fine. Um, shades of black and grayscale. Yeah, you should be okay. Again, it's it's more the size of what you're trying to print uh, than anything else. Uh, although, like you said, with differential contrast, you may lose some of it depending on the intended size of the graphic. But at that point, I feel like we're getting a little bit nitpicky. Um, you know, one thing that we have to realize just off the top, just because of the inherent properties of printing in general, Printing something on a piece of paper is typically going to look better than if I print it on a piece of wood, right? Why? Because of the properties of the paper versus the properties of the wood. All right. Same can be said about printing on fabric. It's more absorbent. 
than a piece of paper. You're not going to get the detail that you get out of that. It doesn't mean you get bad detail. It just means that you're not going to be able to get the fine HD kind of detail. For, if, if, if I was printing a photograph of a customer on a piece of paper, I could probably make out that you know blackhead they have on their nose. But if I printed that same photograph on a t-shirt, it would look the same, but maybe I just couldn't see that blackhead. I know that's kind of a weird example, but that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, da, 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 da. I clean the rubber on the MTS, I'm assuming that's Empire, almost daily. How can I check the seal except by hearing the sound difference when the pump is on? So for that, you're mostly, well, the pump's the easiest way to do it. Um, that's probably why you're coming, you're, you went that way. Um, but uh, you can just gauge your alignment. So making sure that the print head is sitting correctly, make sure that it's seated, uh, aligned correctly with the maintenance station, which it should be. And if you ever feel like you're not, there's a, uh, a way to realign it uh, to make sure that that's the case. <coughs> but once you align it, you should be good. Uh, and the only time it could get misaligned is if you intentionally knock it out of alignment um, or well I could say unintentionally knock it out of alignment by bumping it uh, or something along those lines but then you'd still have to hit it pretty hard. Um, all right last question is we have a brand new full ink cartridge but the printer says no ink how do you fix that? Okay uh, it's possible that your ink um, the chip on your cartridge uh, may not be reading the uh, uh, receiving piece on your printer. Um, uh, it, does, it, won't, it shouldn't prevent you from continuing to print with those cartridges, um, so it's probably just a faulty ink cartridge uh, or faulty chip. Um, doesn't mean the ink's bad, it's just for whatever reason there is a, uh, there is a, uh, there's no contact. Um, one other thing that I have seen happen is that um, Somehow the chip that's on the ink cartridge and the receiving piece that is on the, uh, the printer itself, dust got on there, uh, ink residue got on there, something got on there that is preventing it from reading the chip. That's a possibility. Um, so I would just look into taking it, you know, a gander at that. But outside of that, um, uh, I would bet the next cartridge will be just fine. Uh, anyway, I think that's it, guys. Listen. I really, really, really appreciate you guys. I, I meant to do this a whole uh, hour, but we went a little long because there were so many really good questions. I'm so sorry about that, but I hope you guys all have a great holiday uh, and, a, and a wonderful New Year's. Please, like I said, we do have preferred pricing for anybody that signed on to this webinar. Um, for any new printer sales, uh, contact your regional manager. If you need help, um, you can contact me directly. My email is A as in uh, Adam, T as in Tom, I. P is in Paul, R is in Robert, E is in Edward, at anajet.com. Thank you again so much for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful holidays, like I said, and a, a very, very happy, happy new year. Thank you.